afternoon. It is my pleasure to be here it's in Irvington, Channel 34 in Irvington, and welcome everyone here for my very first episode of my own cable TV show entitled The Griot's Poetry Spot. First of all, I'd like to thank God for his blessing and ask all the elders for my permission to speak. For I respect all the elders that came before me. If it wasn't for them, there would be no me, there would be no us. For those of you who don't know me, let me introduce myself. My name is Craig A. Garner. I'm the author of nine books of poetry. I'm also the Poet Laureate of Irvington. Mayor Wayne Smith appointed me back in 2004, and I would like to make a special thanks to him for that. I'm also a former systems analyst, programmer, project manager, quality control manager for Fortune 500 companies, and, uh, but currently I've been retired from that work. I live, I've lived in Irvington for over 34 years, and I've been elected to the Irvington Board of Education, form, formerly the Planning Board and the Community Relations Board. I've also been president of the Park Place Block Association for 20 years, and I've been elected to the Democratic District Leader in West One for over 25 years. So I've been around, y'all. Well, enough about me. Today we're here primarily to talk about, uh, primarily my poetry books. Uh, Mayor Voss, with his wisdom, his infinite wisdom, had a vision that we should Everyone should have the opportunity to hear and read about my books. But by reading and hearing about your books, you're basically going to hear and read about me. Um, so I will get into that in each episode. I'll get into a different book. Uh, what I would like to do before I start getting into that is explain the name of my show, which is The Griot's Poetry Spot. Uh, the Griot is the name in West Africa given to the story storytellers of African tribes where they maintain the oral history of the entire tribe. And they are very critical to understanding the history, maintaining the history, the rituals, and, and culture of every tribe. I call myself a griot because I uh, myself feel that since I've been writing these books, I've been basically uh, maintaining a history of our people and what's been going on. And I try to be as fair and to the point as I can, but I would be remiss if I didn't say that I have an Afrocentric viewpoint of our history, and I try to blend that in. Since I started learning my history over 25 years ago with people like Dr. Ben and Dr. Clark, I felt that it was really, really necessary to share this information with as many people as possible. But I also realized that most folks would not, may not read all these books that I was reading. So I tried to find a way to allow people to learn about these, this information in an entertaining way, but still get the point. So all my books are written in that manner. And I have quotes in there from great scholars that I normally share. Hopefully I'll be able to share a few of those quotes. Today I will focus on my first, well, let me introduce all my books first of all. As you can see, some of, most of them are uh, sitting right here, but I'll go through the list of them with you. One of my first published books, formerly pu published, was a poetic twist of fate, which I writ wrote because I felt that it was my fate that I landed into writing this, these poetry books, that I ended up going to the First World Alliance, and that it was my fate to try to share this information with all of you. The next one was A Poetic Twist of Faith, a book introduced to highlight an Afrocentric mindset of thought to battle Eurocentric dynamic dynamics affecting our communities. Basically, I was listening to a lot of rap, and I felt that there was a lot of negativity going on with that, and I felt that there needed to be a counterpoint to that. So that's what I did in this book. But I also felt that we needed to have faith 
in who we are, faith in ourselves, faith in our friends, faith in our families, and we need to have faith in that man above if we are to survive all the things that's going on out here. And lastly, it was written as an affirmation of many of the gains that we made in the past and, it, and that I felt that we should be doing things in our, in our lifetime that I believe my purpose is right to share poetry that illuminates situations in this world that need a different mindset. The next uh, book was A Poetic Purpose to My Life when I felt that I was, I was really doing what I was passionate about doing. Writing poetry is something that you can't just do off the, wind, off the top of your head. It has to be something that comes from your heart and you have to be emotional about it and feel strongly about it if it's going to be something that other people can resonate toward. So after writing over 200 poems, I felt that this was, a, this was something that was my purpose in doing and I shall continue doing. next one was a really historic piece called In My Lifetime when Obama, President Obama was initially elected and he uh, obviously made a historic uh, uh, victory by not only running but winning and I felt that uh, I should do a tribute to him because to be honest uh, a lot of people felt that he wouldn't be elected. A lot of people thought that a uh, black man would never be elected in my time, in my lifetime. I had that conversation in barbershops all over. But uh, I felt that he, he had the opportunity to be elected and felt that he would do well if he did get in. And uh, once he did win, we was really, really thrilled. And I wrote a, uh, a book dedicated to all that. But what I also felt was that we needed to understand that it wasn't just him. He wasn't just the reason that we got in. There was a lot of people who worked behind the scenes, a lot of heroes and sheroes like Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, so many people, Dr. Malcolm X, who set the stage, who put the building blocks in place. Uh, Reverend Jackson, he ran twice and lost, but even though he lost, he set, it, set the stage for us to let us believe that, yes, this could happen. And there, there were also many, many other brothers, young brothers, organizations, Black Panthers, many, many people, SNCC. Uh, there were so many people that worked toward this coming to fruition, so we just couldn't say that, yes, this man was so dynamic that he won. These things happened over time to put this in place to make it happen. So that was that in my lifetime, a poetic expression of why it should be. The next one was four more years in my lifetime, obviously, when President Obama was reelected, which was really another amazing historic event. To be honest, I didn't think it would happen because there was so much vitriol and angst against him. His own party wasn't really supporting him as well, the Republican Party was fighting him all the way in his first 42 years and making it very difficult for him to get in. So it, it was very difficult times for him in his first term and I thought his second term that he might have some difficulties but once he won I said okay well we have to have another tribute to him. Uh, during this time we also lost some great people such as Whitney Houston and I had to do a tribute piece dedicated to her. So that, that, that is also encompassed within the book, as well as a piece about the help, this big movie, The Help, where they focus on how many black women had to help. Uh, their job was to work as help in these people's homes, and they really didn't get anything for it, and I felt that we needed to have a tribute to all those people, that all these women who worked to raise their children by, by working in other white folks' homes all their life with hardly no benefits whatsoever. So I figured I needed to dedicate a piece to them. Um, the next one was a real difficult piece 
called Never Miss Your Water Until Your Well Runs Dry. That, um, that piece was born out of the fact that I had a uh, stroke uh, three years ago and I was in the hospital uh, not able to move my right shoulder and my right leg and uh, fortunately it didn't last that long but I was able to overcome it but what that did was bring in the fact my mortality and the fact that I'm not going to live forever and neither will anyone else but while I was in there uh, Nelson Mandela passed away uh, and then the next thing I know uh, Mari Baraka passed away the next thing I know Angela Mayalu passed away Ruby D passed away, <laughs> and all these great artists were just like leaving us, going on to the afterlife. And I says, you know, we need to honor our great heroes and sheroes because they won't be coming back no time soon. There may not be ever be anyone like them again. And so I dedicated this book, Never Miss Your Water Until Your Rail Runs Dry. And also my neighbor who passed away lived right across the street. She's my neighbor and best friend for over 30 years, Marion uh, Scott. She passed away uh, right after I got out of the hospital. And my wife's aunt, a longtime friend of ours, who we call Muddy D, who was an incredible woman, and she had passed away. So with all these people, all these uh, ancestors moving on to the afterlife, I felt that we needed to honor them. And I looked into my history and found out that in Africa, that's what they do. They honor their dead and don't forget them. And they revisit their graves and re-honor them as years go by. So we need to have a way to do that and look into not letting their lives pass in vain. Uh, lastly, well, before I get to this last one, there was another one I wrote, an auto, uh, quasi-autobiographical book. Uh, which I call trouble, as in uh, you cause trouble, because I needed to explain that once you uh, put yourself out there and are willing to speak the truth, that many people may not feel very uncomfortable with that, and therefore they, they might consider you trying to cause trouble when in fact all you're doing is trying to speak the truth and trying to say what a lot of people, many people have said that I say what other people want to say and never say. And that's, I got that from my mother. Was, my mother always did that. She never bit her tongue and she said what just jumped right in her head and I've done the same thing with mixed results. I'm sure it had an effect on my corporate career. But um, I wrote this trouble autobiographical semi autobiographical book to give folks insight into what motivated me, what guided me, what, what inspired me. When I was in Florida in the Air Force, I saw uh, many things that I had never seen in New Jersey. I heard, I experienced many things when I was in New Jersey, when I was in Florida, Pensacola, Florida, in the service. I, uh, we went to a bar down there in Pensacola and were told that we couldn't be served. We had to go, into, go to the back to be served, and I had never seen that. I seen uh, faucets, uh, white only faucets in the, in the baseball park. We went to uh, Mobile, Alabama, where a lady wouldn't serve us and just let us sit there for a half hour without being served, and we had to get up and leave, which, which drives me to my current point in this day and time, is that what I was thinking about when I came here today for this show, is that uh, the things that are going on today are really scary and really serious. Uh, the things that we need to deal with because we cannot we cannot really um, do anything now they, they used to have a, a saying driving while black is dangerous but now uh, just going going to uh, going to a coffee shop is dangerous sitting in a sitting in a waffle house is dangerous uh, sitting in your car and not getting out is dangerous. This last episode where this old grandmother was pulled out of her car because they said she changed lanes illegally and no one would explain to her why they're doing this is just unbelievably uh, uh, 
ridiculous. It's something that we didn't have to deal with. We're going to have to deal with. Which brings me to my last book was The Hypocrisy of Democracy and a Poetic Appeal for Change. This book was written because I was compelled to address numerous killings of black men in this country by other black men and the police, but also numerous black men who were being incarcerated in this country. Plus, it was written to also bring light to tremendous, uh, just to the tremendous number of, of black people who have also been wounded and lost their ability to walk, who aren't even talked about. So there, there's a lot of things going on today that are disturbing and need to be, the light needs to be placed on them so we can address them. Uh, this hypocrisy of democracy is to put light on the fact that we have a democracy where uh, no one is really being served but the select few. And that's not good as I see it. And I'm going to, I've written a number of pieces that reflect that, reflect that thought. With that, I'm going to move on to some poetry, if you allow me, or unless I need to move on to another segment here. I can, um, I wanted to go way back. One of the books I didn't mention is a book, one of my first books. It wasn't published by an actual um, publisher. It was published by myself. It's called Rhymes for Reasons. And in it, when I was rereading it last night, I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read uh, a piece that really resonated with me back in 1987 because it's still relevant today. And the name of that piece is called Now What? And I want to share that one with you because it is highly appropriate for right now with what's going on. So it goes like this. Shall I lower my strong voice to a very little squeak? Shall I bow my head in humbleness, just so your job I'll keep? Shall I speak when spoken to, lest I feel your awesome wrath? Or shall I walk the middle road, so I may stay out of your path? Shall I ignore the wrongs you've done me, thus all the pain I feel? Or shall I just be so very glad that I'll have another meal? Shall I pretend that I am happy, even when it's clear I'm not? And if I do, what will this get me, when loyalty is conveniently forgot? Shall I quiver in your presence and quake at your command? If I do, will you respect me as you do any other man? Shall I buy some skin lightener just to try to comfort you? If I don't, will you contend that our relationship is through? Just because you are afraid of the power of my spurn, you have decided that forever I shall always have to squirm. Well, I refuse to stand for this, for yet another painful day, for I am prepared and willing to bear the price that one must pay, to speak up for my rights and have a strong backbone to defend to the death the honor of my family and my home. That was uh, written back in 1987. But also, what I had decided to do was give a piece uh, on a, a, a brother who doesn't get much credit. Every year, Black History come up, comes around, and everybody's talking about Martin Luther King, Dr. Martin Luther King. But no one really gives another young man who gave his life uh, any credit or little credit, and that is Malcolm X, El Haj Shabazz. This brother put his entire life on the line with the nation of Islam first and then afterwards and he really doesn't get the credit that having a, having him there helped Martin Luther King to be successful because he was the anti-Martin Luther King. He wasn't talking about turning the other cheek. He was talking about an eye for an eye. He's about defending your family. And so I always admired him even before I really started admiring Martin Luther King. So, so I wrote a piece that spoke to the fire in me, and that's what I call it, the fire in me. Really spoke, speaks towards the greatness and imp impact of Malcolm X. So this 
Talk to me like this. The fire in me was lit by he, a man called Malcolm, a man that we can use to measure just how far we've really come or really are. For Malcolm X stood up when most would rather hide or brag and boast how we integrated bathrooms down south, how we can now live next to Whitey's house. But Malcolm tried to clear our view by telling us what he knew was true, even though he knew the truth would hurt and get his name dragged through the dirt. He spoke of helping self and kind, of putting everything on the line. For our people first and foremost, not for some country that loves to boast, boast of the freedom that's in its land, yet spawning groups like the Ku Klux Klan. Boast of the opportunities within our midst while denying most folk, black folks any part of this. He spoke of fighting for our human rights if we truly wanted to change our plight. Self-defense of our children and wives was how he saw us changing our lives. He sacrificed his life for us just so we'll want to own, not ride the bus. Accepted challenges from every foe just so everybody would come to know that African Americans must be allowed to be independent with their heads unbowed. He was our shining prince who didn't last long, but his spirit's alive and will always live on. I did want to uh, get into my first book, a little, a few pieces, and that we'll try to wrap this first segment up. And that's called a poetic, uh, a poetic twist of fate. I'll do a couple of pieces from that that I feel really, really should be spoken on. The first one that I'll do is called Animal because I think a lot of people still view us as animals. They don't view us as people because you couldn't treat, you wouldn't, they treat, they treat real animals better than some of the people that they treat out here, especially people who are arrested for no reason. And uh, I wrote this piece back in, I don't even know, 19, 2004, 2004, so I was sitting with them, some folks uh, in an office, and they saw some young children coming out of school one afternoon, and then a fight broke out, and they started fighting right near, right near the police station. They started fighting, people came out and tried to break it up, I don't know. and so this one lady called them an animal. She said, those are a bunch of animals. And I was like, animal. So I decided to address that in this poem. They call my son an animal, and it hurt me to the bone. It hurt so bad, I hate to say, he never had a home. The child they see is not a child, simply a man disguised as such. For the life he's had, I have to admit, really hasn't been worth much. You see, we're poor as poor could be. I guess it turned out this way. I've seen the pain that this brings to that child each day. Now a chip the size of, of Mount Rushmore just seems to grow and grow until that child and his temper has nowhere else to go. So if he fights soon as you say, Jackie Robinson, remember that he's not a child, even though he is my son. And I did want to share this piece that I wrote just to remind everyone that we, uh, we, stand there, we stand on the shoulders of greatness of anything we we're doing. It wasn't done just because we're so good. We're doing it because others came before us that gave us the DNA to allow us to be able to do what we do today through our forefathers and foremothers. So if you think you're really great, think you're hot stuff, you better look at grandma and say, well, maybe grandma has something to do with it. Maybe grandpa has, maybe uncle, maybe uncle Pete has something to do with it. So this is called shoulder. Sometimes maybe somebody not even in your family. When I grew up, my father was working all the time. He was never home. But there were some men outside in the neighborhood that would help guide me through my life and keep me out of trouble. And I thanked them for that. This was called shoulders. It seemed so easy to somehow forget that all that we are depends on who we've met. 
when we were so young and impressionable, when we had to be told where we should go. For those of us lucky, there was someone there to guide us and provide us with someone who cared. A man or a woman who gave up their time to lend us a hand, to keep us in line. A very kind person who helped us for free, even though they weren't part of our family. They gave us their shoulders when we had none so life future adversities would be overcome. For this I'm so grateful and would thus like to say that I thank them sincerely for being this way. I'll do this last one because it really kind of explains when you see a lot of young men really rowdy, really black men really rowdy and stuff, uh, it really explains where they're coming from, where I feel they're coming from because we've been through a lot. It's called The Jig Is Up, Baby. The jig is up, baby. The cat is out the bag. Our youth has finally awakened and expect to own a jag. Our real history is finally known to all who want to know. We can be proud of our father, forefathers and go wherever we want to go. No longer lag behind the others with complexes everywhere, forever inhibited and thus afraid to take a dare. Now they're bold and bad and challenging. They're everything we should have been. No longer ask us what we should do, but are telling us what's happening. For those surprised or unprepared, you better get on board, since the youth will soon emerge in large, uncontrolled hordes. But fear not this new and beautiful expression, for there's really naught to fear, unless you're a part of the lie, and it's very, very clear. That that, my friends, is a, a little taste of the poetic twist, and I'm going to leave it at that. I, did, I just want to say a happy belated Mother's Day to everyone that, that uh, has a mother, or even if you don't have a mother alive. And it's been my pleasure doing this first segment of the Griot's Poetry Spot. I thank you for listening. I'm hoping that you'll tune in again after you hear this first segment. And I wish you all the best in the future. Thank you very much.